Right, let's make a start. Welcome everyone to the big biodiversity challenge and awards for 2021. Um, looking forward to next year's uh, awards, our seventh awards in 2021. Um, before I hand over to, to Joe, just give you a, an overview of, um, for those people who aren't familiar with Syria, uh, who we are, what we do, and also um, give you um, some backgrounds to the environmental uh, activities that we undertake at Syria. Uh, as, as you will um, see from the next slide, uh, our vision uh, for the last 60 years has really been about nothing else but improving performance in the construction and built environment sectors. And we have a wide remit um, covering infrastructure asset management, as you can see on the, um, the next slide, um, anything from um, civil engineering on, on structures to emerging technologies like UAVs, and, and we're doing some um, embankment uh, landslide, landslide risk um, guidance at the moment, which is obviously topical considering what recently happened at Stonehaven. But I think it's fair to say that um, we, we also, over the last few years in particular, have increased our portfolio of guidance aimed at uh, improving and protecting the natural and heritage environment um, as you can see on the slide, through sustainable water management, sustainability, and um, activities aimed at mitigating contaminants. On um, the next slide, I just wanted to share with you our membership. We've got around 80 members who are supporting our environmental um, activities, and um, uh, they have been at the heart of our work for the last few decades. I'm really pleased to see that we've got uh, members from the EA, Highways England Network Rail, um, as well from the contractor fraternity like Kier and uh, Balfour Beatty and Morgan Sindel and, and BAM. And also, uh, as you can see from the slide, we have a, uh, a large uh, community of consultancies, um, and I'm really pleased that Arcadis Arab, uh, WSP, Atkins, Royal Hasconing, and, and Black and & Veatch are on the call. And, and also we have quite a lot of suppliers in membership and marshals have joined us today. And six years ago, um, our members set up the uh, Biodiversity Industry Group, uh, which was aimed at coming up with um, a, a kernel of an idea around uh, biodiversity. And, and Martina will say a bit more about that later. But I'm really pleased that last year we had our sixth anniversary and we've got grown from uh, we've gone from strength to strength. We've grown to around 600 case studies about biodiversity, more than 35 awards, and four overall winners um, since 2013. Um, and as I know, there's quite a few uh, practitioners on the call who might be interested in in getting more engaged with Syria. Uh, there's quite a few um, communities of practice and specialist networks, as you can see, Sustrain um, Sustainable. Um, the drainage systems is, is one of them, uh, but we also have groups around contaminated land and sand and gravel. I wanted to share just before I finish um, two projects that are up and coming, which might be of interest to you. Uh, do let me know if you're interested in, in contributing. Uh, the first is reviewing one of our best-selling uh, books, which is around environmental good practice on site. It's going to reflect the latest developments in biodiversity net gain, uh, waste management, um, obviously uh, net zero carbon will, will also feature. Speaking of which, uh, we've just recently launched our national net zero carbon for infrastructure, for the infrastructure community, uh, anything from clients to um, contractors and suppliers who are involved in that. And I know we're all trying to do the same thing, um, but I think this forum will try and help you as practitioners to seek out good practice uh, in areas that you as practitioners find really challenging. And we've got the support of Bayes and Environment Agency, WSP and others who um, are helping us with that. And do get in touch if you want to support us in any of these activities. And so before I hand over uh, and introduce you to, to um, Joe, um, just to say a, a massive thank you um, to um, our launch sponsor and client of the year, 
sponsor, which is Kier. Um, as you can see from the slide, we've still got a few categories available, everything from um, the sort of medium, large and small scale projects uh, to community engagement. And uh, last but not least, the biodiversity legacy that you all want to leave us with. So I'd now like to introduce you to Joe, um, who we know well is a great supporter of uh, Syria and Syria's activities in the environment and sustainability theme. Um, as head of sustainability and environment for the Kia Group and formerly head of sustainability for Bunzel, Joe is passionate about the potential for business to do well by doing good. He created Bunzel's Sustainable Future program and has progressed to leading Kia's very impressive sustainability agenda. She has an international background, having worked in India, Australia, and New Zealand. So I'd like to hand over to Joe. Thank you very much, Dirk, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm, as Dirk mentioned, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Kia to um, support the Syria Big Awards and to, um, and in particular, you know, to sponsor the Client Award. We have a fantastic program in store for you all today, so thank you for your attendance. We have brought together some some of the winners from the 2019 Big Biodiversity Challenge to showcase award-winning award-winning examples of biodiversity enhancements in construction and the wider built environment. I am particularly delighted to be joined by Dr. Martina Jervin, Zoe Hilditch, Leonardo Gubert, Martin Gregson, and Julia Lampard as our speakers today. I'm going to begin by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Martina Jervin, who will introduce the Big Biodiversity Challenge and Awards. Martina is a biodiversity and ecosystem specialist with 25 years experience, 15 years of which has been in consultancy. Martina is a founder member of Syria's Biodiversity Interest Group and launched the Do One Thing Challenge in 2013. The success of this challenge led to the big group proposing the Big Biodiversity Awards, which launched in 2014. Martina has continued supporting the big group and the awards throughout the years as a judge and sometimes an award contributor. She has contributed to several documents, developing guidance to maximize the multifunctional benefits of green infrastructure and to encourage uptake of natural design solutions. She is a contributing author for the Natural Capital Protocol and the UK Biodiversity Net Gain Principles. She, is, she currently is part of the SEAM Advisory Group and the Environmental Industries Commission Natural Capital Task Force, which allows her to share and gain insights into the implementation of the natural capital approach to deliver environmental gain. Her role within Arcadis is to promote the embedding of the natural capital approach within projects for clients and different technical disciplines. In Arcadis, we believe that biodiversity and business can coexist to deliver environmental net gain equitably, improving quality of life for all. Martina, thank you very much. And I shall hand over to yourself. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, that was an amazing introduction and very, very kind of you. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward today to um, not seeing you at the minute, but maybe seeing you at the end. Um, and introducing uh, a little bit around how um, BIG came into being and, and how it's evolved over the years. So a very long time ago, it feels like a very long time ago now, um, so the Do One Thing Challenge was launched by the Biodiversity Interest Group. And really that challenge was to just do something because what we recognised is that um, in, in construction in areas where maybe biodiversity wasn't on the agenda, there were still things that individuals could really contribute to to make a difference. And at the time, um, Peter Johnson, who was then uh, the group environmental manager for Kier, and Louise Clark, who was um, the, the big uh, Syria project manager, um, they were uh, two of the really lead, I would say, people in, in helping us form the, the actual Do One Challenge, um, which was so successful, the Do One Thing Challenge, people signed up to it. And then we were really excited about um, getting uh, case study entries and seeing these entries come in, we, we thought, well, actually, these are so great. They need to have a life beyond um, just um, this, that kind of um, individual action. And, and then we held the first awards at Kew Gardens, which were, was a really amazing, uh, amazing night. And we've had over 700 entries over the last six years. 
Now, as you might imagine, when we started, um, there were quite a lot of small, uh, temporary, small-scale entries. So we had the, the very famous um, hat uh, hanging baskets, um, lots of little invertebrate hotels, um, and, and small little planters and things like that. And then the, it's very, very popular, you know, bat boxes and bird boxes. But as the award actually um, evolved, and as, as people, more and more people, I guess, were inspired um, by what was happening, which was entirely what we were hoping for, we got really um, much, much more ambitious kind of nominations. Um, this one here is a self-cleaning um, pool that was uh, built, uh, a temporary construction feature around King's Cross. We have artificial um, sort of rock pool habitat here in vertipools. We have um, uh, construction, temporary construction green walls for um, uh, sort of air purification, but also benefiting biodiversity and passive cooling. We've had quite a few entries where uh, people ha are now um, cultivating their own honey with beehives. We have beautiful um, green roofs. We've even got um, strategies. This is like the nine concepts one from, from Barclay Homes. Um, and then our, leading up to our, our recent winner, which was actually looking at um, really wide scale um, enhancement of the public realm. So we've come come a really, really long way. Um, uh, but we're still we're still interested in, in, in the small, small things as well. Um, now, I do have to update these um, uh, metrics, but we're looking at how big was evolving and, and where the um, where the, the main contributions were coming from. We see that um, the, the transport infrastructure sector are a very big uh, contributor with all of the uh, work that's been going on with academies um, showing here in, in the education uh, sector. And then obviously the residential sector is one that um, because of that interface with the, with the public and that real land value, um, we've always seen um, as, a, as a big proportion of entries in, into big. And in terms of what kind of enhancements that we're seeing, we're seeing in the planters, obviously, in artificial habitat, but now we're really seeing more and more uh, freshwater and uh, terrestrial habitat. And again, looking at the um, the award categories in terms of uh, community engagement is, is, a, is a big growth category. And looking at innovation is, a, is another one that we have reintroduced again this year. And, and big is also spreading. Um, it started off um, really quite a lot of uh, south and uh, southeast centred projects, but we're spreading into Scotland um, and Ireland, and we even had um, uh, an entry uh, from Indonesia uh, one year. At the minute, um, our categories are client-led, which is kindly being sponsored by Keir again this year, but we also have um, a construction phase which can be um, temporary habitat creation. Community engagement, which is always a, a hugely pop popular one, actually. Um, and then our habitat creation, we've separated into to small um, scale and then large scale, because we do really want to see those small scale entries as well as those very big um, uh, big schemes that you know, we'll, we'll be able to devote quite a lot to biodiversity. Innovation is returning again, and we're we're hoping to see a variety of any kind of ideas. From you know, hedgehog highways were were very popular a few years ago, um, but we've also had um, instances where uh, trees have been uh, sort of helicoptered out of the site um, to to minimise uh, the, the footprint. And biodiversity legacy is one that we're really looking towards the future um, as to how how can we perpetuate the the gains and the habitat creation that we have developed, but also how, how that can contribute to the community and wider societal benefits. We have Julia Lampard that's going to um, talk to us later on about a particular project in which we've combined community engagement and biodiversity legacy to um, uh, deliver um, great benefits for um, the community. And pollinator, we still have a pollinator uh, category in there and the sponsorships are available. So please do um, contact uh, inquiries um, at syria.org if you are interested in, in any sponsoring any of the awards. So as I said, it started off with very small things, but what we what we do see is that from these small things, um, really big changes 
in, in sort of attitude and in interest can happen. So we're still interested in people doing um, little things and the, the, the concept of um, that spreading, you know, someone does something a nice on a construction site, maybe a temporary um, measure that people then see, um, uh, people then, you know, are, are, are pleased to, to, to see this and um, are congratulating uh, people on it. Or maybe there's also a little bit of one-upmanship um, when someone sees something really interesting on one construction site, maybe they, they think, well, I can I can do better on mine. So we're still we're still really looking forward to getting those small entries as well, please. And then um, last uh, the last uh, big awards, we saw Cormac Solutions and Cornwall Council um, become the overall winners uh, for big because they, they did a truly um, staggering um, enhancement of the public realm across Cornwall. And while um, creating new habitat is, is, is obviously brilliant and around development, again, what we're seeing more and more around are the opportunities of actually enhancing what you've got, um, whether this is on uh, highways, road verges, or in small plots of orphaned land that um, you, you'll see around city centres. It could be land that is required for an easement. It could be land that was, was previously managed but has been abandoned because of whether it's it's funding cuts etc so what we're seeing is that the real benefits you can make with your existing land but just by making the most of what's there so we're really looking forward to um to seeing the awards this year and um throughout the year we'll also do a few hints and tips around um how to apply um, what the categories uh, mean, what we're looking for in an entry, and I think um, uh, we will let you know when those sessions are running. I think I think that's it for me, guys, um, and I look forward to taking questions either now or, or at the end. Thank you very much, Martina. Um, absolutely fascinating and really shows you know what uh, companies can achieve when they put their minds to it um, to all of our attendees if you do have any questions uh, for Martina please do post them in the question box I'm keeping an eager eye on it and I will capture your questions as they come in um, next uh, we're turning our attention to Zoe so Zoe you're coming into the hot seat shortly um, Zoe will talk about the green uh, sorry, excuse me. So we will talk about the project green infrastructure for growth uh, from Cormac Solutions for Cornwall Council, which was the medium and large scale project award winner in 2019. To tell you a little bit about Zoe, she is a technical support officer for Cormac Solutions Limited, providing project support across our environmental schemes across Cornwall. She has seven years project support experience in the construction industry, including the rail sector. In recent years, her focus has been on design coordination for environmental schemes, producing environmental management documentation, facilitating, facilitating site environmental inspections, and providing a SQL coordinator role within her project team. Zoe, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so my specific uh, project role on green infrastructure for growth um, was design coordination, taking our initial concepts through to designs for construction um, and then documenting what had actually been incorporated into our as-built drawings and then future management plans uh, for the main ongoing maintenance of both sites. Um, so through this process, I've been uh, very fortunate um, to see urban spaces transform um, in a matter of months. Oh, gone too far there. There we go. Um, so the Green Infrastructure for Growth or GI4G project um, was funded by the European Regional Development Fund, Cornwall Council and the University of Exeter. Um, the project stood apart from other schemes as it was a standalone project rather than a response to a planning condition to deliver green infrastructure improvements. Um, prior to the project, the green infrastructure assets were dominated by areas of heavily mown grass of low biodiversity. Um, the green spaces were also of low public interest. Um, the objectives of the project were to improve urban spaces, encourage existing uses and to measure and understand the benefits of improved green spaces from an ecological and social standpoint. Um, so where did we deliver? Um, so the project was delivered within public urban spaces across seven towns across Cornwall. Um, five of those were located in the west and two in the east. 
Um, the target was to deliver 35 hectares of enhancement. However, on completion of the project, 40 hectares was realised. All of the sites selected were Cornwall Council assets and went through a vigorous selection and consultation process by the client team uh, to ensure the sites uh, where most benefit could be added were selected. Consultation also looked at existing volunteer groups who could work collaboratively with Cormac maintenance gangs in the future. Members of these volunteer groups were engaged with during consultation to understand their needs and also to gather local knowledge of specific site conditions and establish species to inform additional planting. Why? Cornwall Council's 2015 environmental growth strategy identified that protection of the environment is no longer enough and that it needs to be invested in and grown. Green infrastructure for growth um, led the way in environmental net gain and worked with local communities to rethink areas of our green space. Another driver was the benefits identified by the project, um, which included improving the wildlife value of an area equivalent to 35 rugby pitches, increasing accessibility to open spaces for all, providing opportunities for outdoor lifelong learning and increasing community engagement in positive green space management. So the biodiversity measures taken um, included new terrestrial habitats created through the planting of new shrub beds, beds of pollinator friendly plants, tree planting and creation of new wildflower meadows. Um, these new habitats have attracted wildlife, improved biodiversity and increased species richness. Um, artificial habitats were created in suitable locations, bird, bat and dormouse boxes were installed by um, licensed ecologists. Um, one of our sites in Bude also featured a bee village um, comprising of three locally produced bee posts um, which are designed as nesting sites for solitary bees. Um, we also had some new aquatic habitat areas that were designed and created on site including swales and wetland areas um, and at one of our sites a pond and dipping platform was designed and constructed um, which introduced yet another habitat to that particular site in question. Um, in order to, uh, to plant these new habitats, Cornwall Council worked with Cormac and Cornwall Environmental Consultants to produce a planting palette, which initially was universal for all of these sites. Um, as the design process progressed and specific site conditions were identified, some bespoke palettes were created to tie in with the existing species on site. Um, so with all these new biodiversity measures being created, how were we identifying success of these schemes? Um, so for, let, for selected sites, the University of Exeter ran pre-intervention surveys um, using questionnaires and observations of people using the parks to understand existing use and opinion of urban green spaces. Follow-up surveys uh, were then carried out to understand the social outcomes of benefits and whether use and opinions had changed. Uh, public response has been agreement that there is now a greater variety of plants and that the areas are good for wildlife. Um, the university also carried out pre-intervention plant habitat surveys at the sites which were followed up with post-intervention plant habitat surveys. Um, and a biodiversity assessment for public areas was developed um, involving habitat area and quality, which has been used as part of Cornwall Council's new biodiversity net gain guidance for developers, which was launched in autumn 2019. You'll also see on this slide um, one of the ways that opportunities for outdoor learning and increased community engagement was achieved. Local schools were invited to participate in bug hotel construction with members of the Cormac landscaping team. Further engagement with schools has included site visits to learn about what animal species to look out for now the green spaces are more diverse. Other community events have included bulb planting, wildflower planting and general maintenance activities with local members of the public and established volunteer groups. So with the new biodiversity measures being created in these open uh, urban spaces. Another key aspect of the project was to increase the accessibility to the new interventions. One of the main considerations was accessibility for all and during the design phase a focus group was held with a user-led and pan-disability organisation which influenced some of the decisions such as the width of the pathways, pathway gradients and the types of seating. 
In some sites, new bound gravel surfaces have been constructed, whereas a softer approach has been taken elsewhere, such as in woodland areas, to create wood chip paths via clearance and reuse of green material. One of the key targets of the project was to have no excavated waste removed from sites where there has been turf stripping for pathways and planting beds, turf and soil has been spread to create low mounds which are then covered with wildflower turf and again creating another new habitat. Seating has been included at most of the sites uh, with two main types being installed. Um, the first was timber or locally sourced granite seating to provide resting places for members of the public. The second were picnic tables, including timber accessible picnic benches, which are designed with wheelchair users in mind. Um, and you can see an example of those accessible timber benches in the bottom right hand corner of the current slide. Um, some of the sites um, in close proximity to local transport corridors, such as the National Cycling Network, have had cycle hoops installed to encourage users into the urban spaces. And finally, interpretation panels, as you can see on this slide, have been installed across the schemes to provide information on the benefits of the new habitats and examples of biodiversity people could now expect to see. So to illustrate how we have changed these urban open spaces, I've picked one of our sites um, to talk you through. Knight's Way is a site in Red Roof, uh, which is in the west of Cornwall, um, in sort of mining country, um, located between an industrial estate, residential housing, and accessible either end by a woodland walk, which itself connects to other residential areas. Prior to the GI4G project, the area was an open space of amenity grassland with poor accessibility for all and low biodiversity value, which you can see in the top left picture. Uh, it's just an open, open field, essentially. One of the key changes to this site was accessibility and connectivity. The bound gravel path was constructed from either end of the woodland walk with two further connecting paths into the Knight's Way estate. Along this path, timber seating and two accessible picnic benches have been installed for members of the public to sit and enjoy the space. In addition to accessibility improvements, there has been a significant change to the biodiversity of this space. Shrubs and perennial beds have been planted throughout, as well as new trees and bulb planting. Excavated turf and soil from the pathway construction and bed creation has been redistributed into low mounds across the site and planted with wildflower turf. Uh, the interventions have vastly changed the topography, biodiversity and way in which people can interact with the open space in a positive way. After this project was completed, I've actually moved within walking distance of this site and have actually been able to capture how this site has established over the past two years. Um, during lockdown, um, you can see from a photo taken in May how the planting is established um, in about 18 months and how the meadows are flourishing. So since winning at the Syria Big Biodiversity Challenge Awards in 2019, GI4G has created a long lasting biodiversity legacy across Cornwall. There has been further investment from the European Regional Development Fund, Cornwall Council and the University of Exeter in another seven different towns under the banner Making Space for Nature, which seeks to replicate the success of green infrastructure for growth. This time more focus has been placed on towns in the east with a 5-2 east-west split. Several lessons from GI4G have been carried forward. Prior to the commencement of the design process, the existing planting palette was reviewed and this was standardised to be used across all sites with a view to minimise the creation of bespoke mixes um, to assist with uh, the overall management plan for all of these schemes. Um, this included a review of the selection of wildflower products, uh, depending on the site condition, in terms of whether the sites would be better suited to seeding or turfing. The design process has also taken into consideration future, future maintenance, including the shapes of planting beds. Beds are designed to interface with amenity grassland with smooth curves to eliminate hard to reach points and awkward angles. Whips of grassland adjacent to planting beds and meadow areas have also been designed to a minimum width to ensure easy access for plant to make maintenance activities as efficient and cost effective as possible. The new sites have also continued to incorporate existing uses of the sites and improve accessibility for all. 
bound gravel pathway specification has been continued through these schemes and has also been used in other capital environmental projects across Cornwall. The selection of furniture for this project has been refined with key pieces being retained, such as the timber seating and the timber accessible picnic benches. The legacy has also been seen outside of our standalone projects. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, urban verges were typically cut around eight times per year. During the pandemic, Cornwall Council suspended grass cutting operations and proposed to continue the suspension of urban verge maintenance with the number of annual cuts being halved. The outcome has been uh, the blooming of more wildflowers, um, which have become a haven for wildlife. Maintenance staff have observed mice, voles and toads in these areas where they haven't been seen for quite some time before. Moving forward, Cormac suggested an alternative regime that would enable wildflowers and grasses to flourish and at the time uh, undertake a degree of necessary maintenance on urban verges. In conjunction uh, with changes to the urban verge maintenance approach, Council has purchased two new Grillo machines, which you can see pictured um, to the right of this slide. These machines collect grass as they cut, and over time this reduces the fertility of the soil, limiting the amount of coarse grass, which makes it easier for wildflowers to flourish. The Grillo machine is cutting four inches above the ground to safeguard small wildlife and leaves areas for wildlife refuge. The new standards of cutting are aligned with the Cornwall Council's Pollinator Action Plan, which was launched in May 2019. The Pollinator Action Plan is a response to the alarming loss of insect numbers and is set out in two parts. The first part sets out um, evidence and need for action, whilst the second is an operational plan which focuses on actions that can be taken by Cornwall Council across their assets, functions and responsibilities. These actions will help to reverse the decline in bees, butterflies and other insects by providing food and places of refuge for pollinators. As we continue these new methods of maintenance in response to Cornwall, uh, Cornwall Council action plans and see new environmental development across Cornwall, we will hopefully continue to see an increase in biodiversity across the county and pave the way for a greener future. Green Infrastructure for Growth was successful at the Big Biodiversity Awards due to going above and beyond what is expected, is extensive benefit to biodiversity and the project was reviewed as being highly replicable. I'm grateful to have this opportunity at this 2021 launch event to share that we have achieved making this replication a possibility through standalone projects, maintenance activities and incorporation of construction and landscaping methods and material selection across other capital schemes. At the point of entering the awards in 2019, we certainly didn't expect to be recognised so highly, so I urge any organisation not sure about whether to submit to set uncertainty aside and get your entries in, as it is a highly rewarding process putting the submission together, and you never know what may happen. Thank you all for listening, and I'll now hand back to our moderator. Thank you very much, Zoe. Uh, God, what a fantastic project. The, um, the detail of thought that went into the design of those green spaces is, is really commendable. You know, very well done to you and your team, and, and definitely a worthy winner. So now we're going to turn our attention to uh, Leonardo. Um, Leonardo is going to talk to us about an award-winning collaboration between Highways England, Kia and ATM. Uh, the project was called Turning A Roads into B Routes and they won the Pollinator Award in 2019. Leonardo himself is an ecologist with over 20 years experience in research, uh, ecological surveys, habitat management and conservation in the UK and abroad. He has delivered many conservation projects aimed at promoting species and habitats along transport corridors and beyond. Some of these projects featured in previous big biodiversity challenges and were either finalists or award winners in the 2015, 2017, 2018 and 2019 awards. Without further ado, Leonardo, over to you. Thank you very much. All right, so, um, well, after that introduction, um, I just feel that I should transport you to a road voyage near you somewhere. So, road voyages, I mean, there's a lot of tension being, um, um, a lot of focus on road voyages and the potential biodiversity um, that is currently locked there. So, for this example, I'm, I'm actually using a road voyage near me. 
So here in this example, you can see that a lot of the land surrounding the road is either agricultural for agricultural purposes, um, they use it for pasture or um, plowing. So the road voyage is really important in this aspect here because it's probably the only section where we have um, unproved, unimproved um, um, soil. And it also kind of carries out a, a really important uh, function of habitat connectivity. So in this example here, you can see the corridor, which is the river corridor that flows under the road and kind of links it to the wider landscape. So in some places, depending where you are and how developed the land or how improved the land is around it, it's probably one of the best links to past landscapes. Uh, it can be of particular ecological value, especially where uh, the road voyages are next to uh, designated sites. It connects uh, wider landscapes and ecosystem. It's relatively undisturbed and it has a high aesthetic value. Um, in, in terms of, um, for some people, this is the only greenery they will see in their day. So in, in, in England and Wales, this area that we talk about, this is quite large. I mean, it's, um, it's 178,000 hectares and they talk about in the UK, we have about 500,000 kilometers of road verges, which is quite significant. So it's a very large area. In, um, in how is England here? Um, in, in England, um, the soft estate or the land between the, the land that is not um, tarmac or a, a, a road infrastructure between the uh, the, the road and the highway boundary is uh, covers about 30,000 hectares. And you can see the network here, the SRN, which is a, a strategic road network, covers a range of different habitats. Um, and this one is kind of a home to kind of a, a, a range of different species, some of them quite rare, such as the death for pink, this pink flower here that you will find on day 38 near Plymouth in Devon. So just to kind of give it a little bit of a bring it into context, this is a study that was part of um, some started about eight years ago. And what we did, we surveyed the, the road voyages between Exeter and Penzance. So this is the A30, A38 trunk roads west of Exeter, covering a, a total length of 284 kilometers in 450 hectares of grasslands and heathland habitats. So this represents only a tiny little fraction of the total area of Great Britain. And just in this section here, in this tiny fraction, we actually recorded nearly 25% of the native species described in the new atlas of British and Irish flora. So it's, it's quite important. It's only a tiny fraction, but it's still quite, quite diverse. So we had, with that in mind, we started gathering information and see how they, can we improve the road verges. So this is a really important uh, part of your project if you want to create something that will benefit biodiversity and the uh, wide environment. So we take a number of different surveys, we collect data in a number of different ways, from desktop surveys to our own uh, ENVIS, which is our, our environmental um, information system, where we record um, different species and habitats in detail. Together with drive-by surveys, habitat and botanical surveys, and soft estate condition surveys, which we do regularly to make sure all the, uh, the, the trees are being managed the way they should and the grassland is being cut, etc. So that is, um, makes kind of the, uh, the, the, the background uh, data to our project here. And as part of the uh, information collection, we did a pollinator study um, in 2015, which was really useful for this project in particular. Because what I was looking for is identify hotspots for pollinators within um, road verges. So we looked at a, at a number of different sites uh, covering a range of different habitats, grassland, heathland, scrub, and with no surprise, we found that the highest diversity of pollinators was associated with the higher diversity of plant species. 
So in total, we found 866 different taxa, and some of them were quite rare. Um, 16 national scar species, quite um, uh, four species of principal importance, and one endangered species. Now, we knew that we, we were going to find some, you know, some rare notable species because basically there's very little research done in broad verges as we speak. I think this is kind of gaining more and more attention and um, more resources and kind of more funding for this sort of work, which is kind of uh, is really important. So the other trick that we used for this um, project was um, a habitat connectivity mapping. So we did what we did, we used a mixture of LIDAR um, data together with satellite imagery. And we compiled some quite kind of fancy models here that will kind of pick up priority areas for a number of different species. So we, we, you can do it for individual protected species. In this case, we use for butterflies, bees, mammals, moths, and separated them in the yellow shaded area is the areas where you have uh, good uh, records, good potential for habitat creation for uh, butterflies and bees. So just knowing the location that you want on a road verge is not enough. So you still need to go out and make sure that what you, whatever you want to do is possible. Uh, you need to look at the technicality of it or the practicality of it. You need to look at things, uh, things such as access, um, whether you need to close a lane or close a whole road. And this scheme was quite tricky because we had to do it at night because the A38 here is so busy that if we close the lane, it would just cause chaos. So the type of areas I was looking for when um, uh, looking for a site was uh, I needed somewhere where the soil is suitable it's not species rich, and it's somewhere where I could get the machines and uh, equipment um, uh, at, at night time. So these are two of the sites I, uh, I found. And then in order to do that, I think the, um, one of the key things that was really important for me, I just wanted to make it as simple as possible. It's something that can be um, uh, replicated anywhere, any verge, anywhere in the country. So what we did is looking for a method that um, I could use just uh, with using a standard um, roadside machinery, uh, roadside grassland equipment, uh, management equipment. So I think one of the first steps is uh, to treat scrub, which basically reduced competition and um, um, with the, the future grasslands. You can do that quite simply with one of these uh, um, uh, knapsack sprayers, and then implement a cut and collect, which was the first thing. It's really important that you kind of uh, remove the risings that you cut. There are a number of different machines that you can use. You can use this one that collects is a little bit older than the one you, you saw earlier, but it's, it's equally efficient. Cuts and collects everything that rises in a box, or nowadays these uh, much bigger, more expensive machines, they are becoming um, a lot more common. And they have been used in continental Europe for many years. Uh, basically, it's just a flail head with a vacuum that kind of collects all the risings to the back of a trailer. So once you do that, or you can either do, if you haven't got one of those fancy machines, what you can do is use one of these mechanical rakes. This one is mounted uh, on one of the um, uh, remote control uh, machines that you see quite regularly now on, on road verges. They're an incredible piece of equipment. And they're really good because they kind of break that real thatch of um, uh, grass and uh, bramble and on, on the um, at ground level. So leaving behind this kind of an open uh, bare ground that will be really important uh, when it comes to you ground preparation. Now, this is the bit that we really need to spend time is kind of make sure that you have a nice growing medium for the seeds or whether you're using seeds uh, or uh, green hay for other sites. I mean, for this scheme in particular, we actually use uh, seeds. So the ground to create the tilt, we actually use the, the same machine that we use to cut the grass, set a very low level. 
So what it does, it kind of disturbs the top few centimeters of the soil, creating a really nice fine tilt. And then by hand, you can remove any bigger uh, uh, pieces of uh, wood or stone. And then once that's done, you seed it. You can roll the seed. Again, you can just use the same machine they use for the grass cutting. Some of them, they have a, a flail head with a roller. And you can set that low, just kind of making sure there's a really nice contact between, uh, between the seed and the soil. So if all goes, goes well, you start to see some results in the following spring. And then this is a good time to go back and retreat and treat any um, unwanted species, such as uh, weeds, uh, thistles, and ragwort, or bramble. Or you, in case you had some invasive species, there was, would be a, a, would probably a good time to uh, uh, check on them again. So for the future maintenance, it's really important uh, to uh, uh, cut and collect the risings. Um, depending on the, the, the grass and the species they're using, it will be any, anywhere from uh, early summer to uh, autumn. So in the spring, this is when you start getting your results. Um, as part of this project in particular, we use a, 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 a different, a, a quite kind of a, a different uh, mix of um, species. We use the uh, annuals and a number of other species local to the area. And the other thing that's quite important is to source your seeds locally so that you're not bringing something from abroad and you're using species that are well adapted for the uh, local conditions. So here you have all these annuals, which is a beautiful. They kind of bring a really nice color, but then they need to get all the perennials. These are the tree, uh, the plants that will stay there in the long term. So you got all the yellow rattle, which is this one here, is uh, really useful. We've been using this on roadsides uh, for years now because they reduce the competition and, and growth of grasses. So they're quite important tool to use on the um, wildlife, uh, wildflower meadows and roadside verges these days. So if you do, everything goes well, the results are quite striking. So this is the following spring and we saw this for kilometers. It was just a, an unbelievable um, corridor and display of colors. So the, in, in comparison, what we saw here in terms of insect numbers um, and um, uh, diversity in, in flowers and, uh, and other grass and plants are quite incredible. And the really nice thing to see was how that had a, an impact on people as well. So this was kind of a, it, it was unmissable and was well documented, was really welcomed by the media and uh, uh, local road users. So this was something that um, it gave us um, the courage and the motivation for future schemes. So it was really important to have that feedback back to us. So as you see, road verges, they're really important. And um, I think there's a lot of work to be done um, still. And I think I'll just, um, I'll just close down here with a, a few pictures that I've taken and um, some of my colleagues have taken and the uh, road verges here in the Southwest where I'm, I'm based. So I think that kind of was useful to you. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonardo. And um, I, my family actually lived down in, uh, in Devon. I'm very familiar with the A38. And I saw the verges in bloom. And they were absolutely spectacular. And it really does make, you know, demonstrate straight quite clearly. If we make the space, you know, nature will come. And it was an absolutely incredible achievement. Thank you very much for sharing with us all. Right, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker now, who is uh, Martin. So Martin is our fourth speaker today. Um, he has spent 16 years in the public sector within the environmental compliance and enforcement sectors, ensuring businesses comply with their legal obligations uh, when it comes to protecting the environment. He's a gamekeeper turned poacher. He then ran, he then moved across to the private sector and has worked in the rail industry as well as environmental uh, management for the last nine years. At Siemens Mobility, he is responsible for the rail electrification, environmental compliance and performance, and was part of the 2019 award-winning team for the Sussex Power Supply Upgrade. Martin, welcome, and over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Just, 
done. Well, okay. So I'll just get run through the project that won the award. Um, I just want to stress that uh, I think it's important to, when you look at some of the other applicants, the scale of some of the projects that have been involved. This is a relatively small project, um, and it just goes to show that it doesn't matter how big the project is, you can still make a difference. Um, so what is it all about? Um, Uh, the power supply upgrade project was uh, to enhance the network running from London down to Brighton and then the coastways across towards Southampton. Um, anyone familiar with that route knows that uh, it has had capacity issues over the years. Um, so what they, they were doing was to increase the size of the train sets that were running along that line. Um, we got to a point where the larger train sets were in use on the line but unfortunately the amount of power that was available um, offset the benefit to the longer trains so what was generally happening was the, um, the trains had to set off from the stations slower and build up speed gradually um, because if they put the power on too quickly uh, like your own uh, supply at home if you draw too much power all at once it's likely to, to trip the fuses, which uh, was happening. So they put the longer trains in, but they were having to upgrade the power availability for the lines, um, and that's where this project came in. So it was uh, building a number of um, substation um, upgrades and new installs along the line down to Brighton and then across on the coastways. The particular project that this was um, centred on was in Whiteleaf South. Um, it was a site, I think it's, it's south of um, South Croydon, uh, just inside the M25 corridor. Um, it was a particularly difficult site. It wasn't a, a big site. Um, and in terms of the technical aspects of what we were doing, it's pretty similar to a lot of the other sites we were working on. But what was unique about this one was the is the access available to get to that particular site. Um, the as with a lot of locations along the network, um, there's very poor accessibility for maintenance, um, and there's a lot of reliance on third-party negotiation to access across other people's land to access some of this uh, infrastructure. And that's the case at Whiteley South. Um, it was obviously trackside uh, adjacent to Whiteleaf South Station, but with no uh, direct vehicular access for um, taking in equipment, materials and things. So um, there was a negotiation with the adjacent landowner who owns a large woodland next to it, uh, but also runs a business from that woodland. Um, with uh, beehives and um, I've got some geese and things on in at the top end of the woodland. So the site required us to look at how we could access through that woodland um, to get to the actual substation uh, upgrade site that we were working on. It was quite clear um, from the very first visits that something different had to be done on this site. It wasn't going to be business as usual. Um, just the Google Oval shot of the site. The bottom area here is where the substation was. This is White Leaf South Station right next door to it. Um, and yet it was impossible to access the substation from the, the rail side. So the access about half a kilometre through the woodland all the way through to get to the substation. So that confronted obviously very initial walkouts on site. Um, identified I think how difficult this project was going to be in terms of mobilization. Um, large, um, there was two uh, transformers that needed replacing so that they needed to be removed, we needed to bring in new transformers, um, there was a lot of other additional equipment, uh, switch gear and the like that needed to come through, all the building materials for the, the bases, the concrete and all that kind of thing. Um, obviously the environment itself, it's quite a sensitive, uh, environment, environmentally sensitive woodland that needed to be protected. 
um, and there were other issues, especially with previous works that had uh, taken place in that woodland. So one of the things that we had to put at the absolute top priority was working with the key stakeholders on this. Um, the project was handed to us uh, by the client uh, and the expectation was to deliver it in the normal manner of um, negotiating access to the neighbouring land, um, building a the usual haul road through uh, that would take the necessary weight. And in this case, we were looking at up to 36 tonne uh, HGVs to be able to uh, carry the heavy plant in and out. Um, and so we visited and it was, as I said, there was previous activity um, about a year and a half, two years before we arrived that caused a lot of problems for the, the woodland landowner. Um, and there was evidence if we did the walkthrough that there was significant damage to the soil structures the path had been taken through. Um, that had been particularly badly churned up. The drainage was quite poor in areas. Um, and so the, the landowner themselves was quite reluctant uh, and certainly worried about the, the, the impact it was going to have to have yet another project coming through the woodland. I can't stress enough how important it was to maintain the relationship with these stakeholders. Uh, and on the very first um, visit on site, um, we made sure that we had the landowner with us. We invited the local authority tree officer because the woodland itself was designated um, under statutory protection. So there wasn't individual tree protection orders, but the whole woodland itself was covered by a, a tree preservation order. Um, so we had the local authority there, the neighbouring resident that we were going to work, be working in close proximity to, we, we also met on site to just discuss what was going to be happening. But the key people were the client, the landowner, the council and our own project management team of course, because um, again, when you first pick up these jobs, they, they, they immediately revert to type and go, right, yeah, this is how we normally do it, this is how we're expecting to be able to deliver this. Uh, and from that very first visit, the walkthrough and the discussions that were being had, it's very clear that something different had to be done. Um, when we're talking about the size of the vehicles that had to go through that woodland up to 36 tonnes, the construction of the whole road uh, was going to be significant. That was to reduce the footprint of the um, impact on the, on the ground structure. Obviously, we have to look after the root protection zones of the woodland uh, so that they were not having less damage on the trees and things. Clearly, with those sizes of beetles going through, we also had to look at potential removal of a few trees along the route to enable the curvature of the, the whole road to enable the large beetles to get through there. Um, and all that was kind of discussed and indicated on the first visit. And so we decided that actually we'd go back to the drawing board and see if there's other ways that we could actually achieve the same outcome. So the three areas that particularly looked at in, in the design stage, um, again, this is an area that um, we benefited most from was having this sustainability by design approach. It was no good looking at these things uh, once it was handed over for delivery to problem solve. Um, here's a nice design. This is what you need to put in there. We're not particularly interested in how you're going to achieve it and leaving it to the delivery team to scratch their heads and go, right, OK, that's going to be difficult we made sure that this was embedded in the very planning of the project from the start. So we're looking at the woodland protection, the things we just talked about, uh, protecting the existing trees that were there, the, the root protection zones in particular. The uh, We had a, an engineer do some calculations uh, that gave us an indication of the amount of material that we were going to have to bring in um, to provide that loading um, for the heavy vehicles to go through. There was certain patches of the woodland where the, the woodland rides um, had some um, locally significant species. Um, the woodland owners were particularly proud of the way that the woodland had been managed over the years. And there's quite a rich uh, um, flora covering in certain areas of the woodland. Um, obviously, as we discussed as well, we're, we're very keen to protect the interests of the landowner. The landowner was very concerned, very reluctant, 
and took a lot of persuading. But I think very quickly, when you start to build these relationships and show that, A, you understand their needs and you understand what we need to achieve for them as well as what we need to achieve for ourselves, and then sticking to it and ensuring that we actually are honest in our approach, we say exactly what we can and can't do, make sure that it never carries on through. And then we wanted to obviously not, we wanted to go beyond compliance in terms of making sure that not only are we protecting it, but they would look for opportunities where we could leave enhancements. The air quality side is also important to us, obviously, with the number of large vehicles we're going to have to come through. This is a, a role of village. Um, so we're going to have to bring quite a few vehicles to the, the narrow country lanes around there, um, increasing the amount of heavy traffic for the local um, communities. Um, likewise, there was no uh, power supply at the top end of the woodland where we were going to place the welfare um, site uh, drop-off and storage facilities. And of course, we had the increase of the amount of vehicles actually traveling through the woodland and carrying materials up and down. Um, and then the actual works themselves, the amount of waste that it was likely to produce. So that's from the amount, the huge amount of virgin um, material we had to bring in for the whole road. We couldn't just use recycled materials again because of the risk of bringing in contamination to the woodland. So it, it was going to have to be virgin materials. It creates a lot of waste for what we do after the, end, after the uh, site is demobilized. And then the construction materials and waste from the works that we're doing. We had to take down part of the existing structure, um, lots of brick and concrete uh, material, and also some excavations where we're gonna put the new concrete bases in for the new transformers. So all these kind of things um, <coughs> fed into the, the initial planning stage. And um, we had an excellent project team, and again, working with the client, because the client had an expectation of initially how we're going to deliver this and we were pushing back at the clients and actually no we're going to try and deliver it in a totally different way of course it's easy to in hindsight look at these things and go yeah it's all brilliant we did it, you know it made all the right decisions but at the time trying to persuade the client that potentially there's, there's increased upfront costs there may be benefits elsewhere but it's hard to quantify right at this moment in time um, but the argument was put in the client being along with us on, in terms of all the visits we've done, the initial uh, scoping visits to the site, understood actually why it was important to look at these different things. Um, this is the solution that they finally came up with. Um, they managed to secure a 450 ton mobile crane unit, which is only one of two in the country, uh, that could be set up in a sh relatively short period of time when it was needed. Uh, what this did was change the way that we could approach the, the overall project. So this enabled us to deliver the heavy items, so the transformers in, take the old transformers out, uh, bring in and out the heavy plant and equipment and the materials that we needed straight in from the car park side of the um, station lift it all the way across the station across the tracks near the opposing platform across over the tall trees and, and drop it into the substation that sits alongside to the left there in the, the center picture so this enabled us to actually rethink how we were going to approach the actual um woodland hall road system which was one of the biggest issues that we had in terms of what we we're going to do uh, by reducing the amount of materials that had to be taken through the woodland we were able to reduce the woodland uh, access down to a maximum five ton capacity. So that meant we didn't have to bring in uh, a huge amount of aggregate material. And the solution that we, we came across with some engineering input was a hard um, hardwood chip solution. So it was about 100, between 100 and 200 mil, depending on the subsoil conditions in each area of wood chip on a um, geotextile membrane and then a um, plastic bolt together track system that went, went through the entire woodland from the our uh, uh, welfare unit half a mile half kilometer through the woodland to the actual site we we're working on and as you can see in some of the pictures there you can see the plastic track system they all bolts together 
uh, helps to spread out the weight, prevents the um, um, sideways lateral movement of the, of the soil conditions when vehicles are going around the bends and things, uh, and the hardwood chip cushioned any of the impact on the ground itself. Um, the bales there were brought in to protect specific trees that were on bends or in, in areas that potentially could end up with impact. Uh, some barriers as well to mark off areas to prevent vehicle going through. And the other big area that we managed to achieve was um, what to do with all the demolition materials. So what we agreed um, with the client was that we were going to actually put all the um, waste material, construction materials onto the uh, linear rail network along adjacent to the woodland um, where there was a, an area of um, unused land that the network rail owned. And that enabled us to prevent all that material being taken off site. Um, we got waste uh, permit exemption into place. The materials that we wanted to drop down is all inert building materials. Uh, been tested, there's nothing in there that gave cause for concern. Um, and as you see from the pictures here, um, the start of the, the use of the materials, so there's pallets, there was um, bricks, concrete materials, plastic tubes, um, uh, and bits of straw and other things to start creating the habitat that we were creating along the linear project. If you look at the picture on the bottom right hand side, that's a view down the, the long linear um, corridor that we were building this all this habitat. Um, we finally capped off a lot of this um, towards the end of the project when we had the excess risings that we dug out for the concrete bases. For the new transformers so the, the finished product is is slightly more um uh, covered and, and it's blending in nicely now um now obviously as with all things um when you see some of the detritus and mess that's left along our network um contractors like ourselves will come and, and first thing we generally do is try and clean up in the site and areas that we're working so to stop somebody coming along after us and going Gosh, they've left a load of rubbish behind and try and clean it up. We made sure that we've left um, habitat signage all the way along the network uh, where we put all the material and the habitat creation uh, with an indication of what we're trying to achieve and, and some information to go with that. So now, if you, the previous um, um, slide is the one of the signs that we that's the sign that we put up and um, we also put some along um facing the platform so people actually some there on the platform could read um some of the things that have been happening in the area behind them so in terms of what we achieved with this um bearing in mind it was a small project um, we managed to save over £70,000 in material costs. Um, so that was a, a huge reduction in the amount of virgin aggregate we had to bring in. It was a reduction in the transportation of the waste going back off site. Um, and that's on top of the additional costs of things like the crane that had to come in um, and some of the other things. So £70,000 saved is a, a significant saving. We were very, very pleased with that when it finally came through. And in fact, that wasn't what was driving some of the, the decision making. That was a, an added bonus at the end. Um, over a thousand tonnes of waste avoided. So that was the significant haul road material that had to be lifted at the end. We avoided all that. All the demolition waste, we avoided taking any of that off site. Um, all the wood chip um, materials that we bought in were reused. So uh, the landowner themselves um, used a bit for soil enhancement around the woodland. They um, improved some of the pathways through the woodland, and the rest was given to the um, there was a a community. Um, 
park area just a little bit further down that we, they had their paths enhanced with all that material as well. So none of that ended up as waste. Um, and as a result, we reduced the amount of heavy vehicles moving through the woodland, uh, sorry, through the local community uh, on the, all the um, rural roads by over 500 heavy vehicle movements, which is significant again. That helps to reduce the, the burden on the local air quality, help to reduce the noise impact and the disturbance from the vehicles. Um, with all the additional um, habitat that we created along the that section are adjacent to the woodland, um, we, uh, we know that we've had a, a significant biodiversity net gain, and that's something we're gonna pick up on going forward and ultimately the the way that it was conducted um, left the landowner extremely pleased having been very um, resentful of the initial idea of another yes another um, contractor coming in and, and spending six months trundling through their woodland and leaving it in a sorry state they uh, they were exceedingly pleased with the way that it turned out um, the this is a written quote to our client from the council from the senior tree officer who was involved all the way through um we made sure that they we negotiated with them in terms of the, the ground protection scheme that we're going to put in place we arranged site visits once it's all down so we could see that we had followed through on what we said we were going to achieve and again once it has all been lifted and we demobilized from site we then arranged a final visit with the council so that they could come and see the condition that we'd left the woodland rides through. Um, it was important to us that um, through the building of that trust that we could clearly demonstrate that we, we meant what we said. Um, and the woodland owner also contacted our client, um, which helps in terms of the client uh, access going forward. Um, We've managed to turn a landowner from a really resentful, there's quite a lot of them are when they deal with our client, uh, into somebody that actually can understand that these things don't necessarily have a, a long-term negative impact on, on their land. So overall, um, in terms of uh, putting in for the awards, now again, I'd stress that it's important that this was a, you know, as a, as a business, we, um, the types of projects that we undertake aren't the big infrastructure schemes that a lot of our uh, peer group get involved with. We're not um, talking about huge quantities of money that we can spend on these schemes. So anything that we can do, um, we feel is, is quite small in comparison to some other schemes. But actually, it's not the size, it's the quality of what you achieve is important. And anybody listening, if you're, if you're looking at projects and think, actually, we can only do a few bits here and there, as long as it's quality in terms of what you achieve, it's well worth putting it forward. Uh, and as for awards, I'm a huge believer in, in putting in for these awards because it helps you to, to benchmark against your peers in terms of what you're achieving. Um, you get recognition for the project team themselves because after, after all, it wasn't myself that put all the effort into achieving this. It was the project team themselves, the project manager. Um, working with the design teams initially, then working with the delivery team on site to ensure that everything was delivered as we expected it to be delivered. It's an opportunity for us as well to talk at events like this to show that what we do, because a lot of it, in, again, in, in the important thing is this is replicable. You know, it's it's the kind of thing that we can pick up. Uh, we see other people doing similar things. We say, oh yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, we can give that a go on our one of our sites. And likewise, we, it's a good opportunity for us to share what we do so that other people go, actually, we can take bits of that. Um, for example, the, the uh, trackway, we made an agreement with the crane company. So I think the trackway costs £100,000 overall uh, to purchase and install. Uh, and the crane company purchased it back off us at the end of the job, um, I think, for £50,000, £60,000. So overall, it was a relatively small figure for what would have been a huge cost of installing a, a trackway. So it's those kind of things that we, we managed to achieve. And again, uh, it's, then it gets reused um, for other schemes. And so it's not, again, it's not waste at the end of the job. Um, it also helps the business, uh, I think, to understand that these things are important. Because when you're in your little bubble, um, it, you, 
sometimes you forget actually there's other people doing other things out there and this is an opportunity for us as an organization to go out and see what other people are doing as well as showcase what we're doing it helps to drive that sort of that behaviors internally that these things are becoming the norm and these are the things that we must drive towards you know it's, it's that beyond compliance uh, excellence we should all be going for and of course final point and it, It'd be rude not to mention it. This is the kind of thing that um, you know, if you're putting in for uh, tendering, you know, it's all about work winning, and these are opportunities to show that you have been ben benchmarked against your peers, and that you've achieved something special, and it's something that um, gets like to be seen. So, I shall, uh, on that note, I shall hand back to Jane. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I like how you describe that as a small project. <laughs> Doesn't seem small to me at all. And uh, but you know, just to reiterate a point that you've made, along with a couple of other of our presenters today, for all of you on the call thinking about entering, you know, please don't self-edit your achievements. Um, you know, it's it is a our panelists have been a great job of demonstrating you know every achievement counts here and and uh, you know a number of you can be quite delighted by seeing your um, your achievements this year recognized through the big awards so please do enter uh, now without further ado i would like to introduce our fifth and final speaker uh, julia, uh, julia lampard julia leads the award-winning saplings project at treehouse school in north them. This project was spearheaded by the charity Ambitious About Autism, and I am delighted to hand over to Julia and hear about her award entry. Julia, over to you. Hello. Just... Hi. Aha, good, my slides are there. Okay. So, just tell you a little bit about Ambitious About Autism. We're a medium-sized autism charity and we're, our headquarters are in London and uh, our main business really is education. But actually more recently we've been um, highlighted by our young people. Employment is a big issue for them. So this project fits in with our, our um, uh, employment work really. So um, we've from the education point of view, we've got two schools and two further education colleges, um, and we work with young people four to 25. So the site, the Sapling site, it's it's in the London borough of Haringey. Um, interestingly, about 50, 60 years ago, it used to be tarmac tennis courts for Thames Water, and Thames Water have actually leased the site to us uh, for a pound a year for 20 years, which is brilliant. Um, it's a, a, a sink and it's significant open land. So I came up with a project. Um, I kind of literally drew it up on the back of an envelope, went to see Haringey and said, do we need planning permission? And they said, well, no, you don't, but maybe good practice put, put in for planning permission, which was literally for um, a fence to keep our pupils safe and a shed and a polytunnel. Uh, and all hell let loose, which I was not expecting from the local community. So we uh, we didn't anticipate that at all. Um, the upshot was that we had to have two attempts at getting planning permission. Um, and once it was granted, a local group then took Caring Gate to judicial review. So it was it was tricky. Um, so therefore, there was a very, very big piece of work really to do uh, in terms of winning over our local community. And really the best way to do that, I think, was to try and get them as involved as much as possible and to sort of demonstrate through our actions that the, the project was a worthwhile project. So just a little bit about autism, because I tend to take everybody every opportunity to tell people about it. Um, so the, the pupils that are actually using the site, there are treehouse school pupils and they're aged four to 19 and they have they have very complex autism. Um, I'd say 80 percent of them don't have speech as their way of communicating. They've got big behavioral problems, some of them, uh, learning difficulties and associated issues like epilepsy and allergies. So they're, they're young people with quite a lot to, to deal with. Um, but despite that, we feel that they and all of the other young people accessing our, our um, charity at some point are entitled to some sort of employment, be it rather different from what we're, you know, you or I are used to. Um, so 
Around 700,000 people in the UK have got autism, but only 16% of autistic adults are in full-time employment, which is quite a poor figure when you consider, you know, a lot of these are university graduates and so on. So what's our Saplings project? Um, it's a social enterprise which we've set up with an organisation called Ad Organic Lee, which is a community gardening project. And we have the young people growing vegetables and flowers organically and ultimately trying to sell them locally. Um, and we are teaching pupils things like no dig horticulture, how to create their own compost, companion planting, making leaf mould. So, so sort of quite sophisticated things in some ways, but we have pupils working at very different levels. So actually for us, a major achievement is also just having a young person being able to tolerate wearing shoes for a session. Um, the project, I can, I can beat Martin, we have zero budget. So, um, so I had to think of a way to try and get some money for the infrastructure. So we managed, we put in for a couple of grants and got those, which was, which was brilliant. Um, we pay our young people for their sessions. Uh, we pay them 20p to turn up, uh, 50p to stay for the whole session and a 50p bonus. So we're big, we're big payers. So the land that we, we inherited, the picture on the left shows it as it was when we took it on. So the section in front of the privet hedge here was completely overgrown really with, with brambles and cooch grass. And then behind that hedge, there's about two thirds as much again space, which is which is woodland, which we were keen to try and um, disrupt as little little as possible, really. Where we're at now is this second slide shows you the section that we have um, got ready for the horticulture work with the pupils. And so we've we've um, made a load of raised beds and, and sort of various other pieces, which I will talk about as we go through. So in terms of community engagement, that was really obviously very important for us for a number of reasons. Um, without some sort of help, we were never going to have an infrastructure. So we uh, have engaged with a, a wide range of corporate volunteers. And typically we, we've had people from uh, Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, Acom, Marsh Insurance, a wide range of people. And typically they'll come to us for their um, uh, their, their sort of uh, community service uh, giving back type days. Another way I fund the project is we charge them for the uh, for the joy of coming along to help us, which is probably a bit mean, but it works for us. Um, and they have been completely brilliant. I mean, it's unusual to get people. They don't necessarily know much about gardening or so and so on, but they're always very, very willing to help. And sometimes they'll have the most amazing skill set in terms of, um, for example, Acom uh, built a polytunnel for us in a day, which was fantastic. Um, community groups also very important, given how poorly we were received initially. So we have just looked at who's out there. We have a. Um, We've engaged with a couple of uh, local housing setups for uh, people over the age of 55, and, and they've been great because a lot of them are people who've downsized from large houses, and so they, they welcome the opportunity to be able to access some um, outdoor space. And what we've done is we've given some of them some of the raised beds so that they can also participate uh, and work alongside our young people. We've also had some great help from an organisation called Men Shed, which is a national movement. Um, and from them, we've had lots of people with quite good kind of woodworking skills, which we lack. So that's been brilliant. And then a real mainstay for us has been engaging with local volunteers. Uh, and that's been important really for a number of reasons. First of all, it's been a, a fantastic way to sort of allay the concerns of the local community. Once they start getting involved with us, they can then talk to their friends about what we're doing and that, um, you know, children with autism aren't too bad, really. And, and, uh, uh, and, and they also have been they've made some amazing things for us. So this picture that you see here, uh, one of our volunteers has made a whole heap of um, raised strawberry planters out of just bits of wood that he had knocking around or that we had around on site or that we sort of begged begged and borrowed from local timber merchants. So we we do an awful lot of recycling. Um, so yeah, community engagement vital. Uh, we totally rely on 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 our community. 
The other thing that we really needed help with was um, we knew something about sort of biodiversity, but not enough really. Uh, and so we were we were really grateful to Arcadis, who they they produced an ecological management plan for us. And what that does is it gives us a sort of rolling program of of how we should be managing the site, uh, which has been incredibly helpful. So the sorts of things that we've done, uh, the woodland space had had quite sort of dense trees there. We've opened up the tree canopy. We also had quite a lot of sort of non-native stuff because we have allotments next door and they kind of used the space as a bit of a dumping ground. So we had lots of cotoneaster and stuff from ponds and sort of random things that you wouldn't naturally have found in the woods. So we've, we've gradually been removing that. Um, we do rotational cutting of the grassland to try and improve the reptile habit habitat. And we've taken out this, the brambles insane. I mean, it just grows so quickly. So we tried to keep about 50% of that removed. Everything that we cut down on the site or cut back, we keep there. So we've created log and brush piles. We've used the grass for sort of reptile spaces. So we keep everything there. Um, we've put up bird and bat boxes and we've created, we've left sort of little spaces in the, in the various fences for um, wildlife, which mostly seems to be local cats, but we have got some foxes as well. So we've done some we've done some other things in addition to uh, what's actually in the environmental management plan. Um, we've uh, reused some of the uh, pruning off cuts to create some dead hedging, and that was really that was a really nice activity to do with the kids. We've created a thing which you can't really see it very well here. It's it's called I think a willow car, but actually what what it looks like now is it's it's a sort of willow den, and it provides a great space for the shade um, for the kids when they're working there in the summer and we also planted it in an area that was incredibly wet in the winter so it's been it's been fantastic because it's reduced the sogginess of the space but it's um it's also created this lovely shade for us wildflowers we've we've created sort of wildflower patches at the front of the site so this is this is one of them growing wildflowers is not as easy as we thought it was going to be so it took a little while to establish um, and we were really useful, uh, help, uh, lucky to have seeds from um, an initiative from Q called Grow Wild, which was great. We had some beautiful um, crab apple trees at the front of the site, which were really not in a good way because they were choked with ivy and, and had uh, epicormic growth and so on. So we've, we've again, we've removed some of that. Uh, pupils have done some of it, volunteers have done some of it. And then we mulch them with wet newspaper and bark, uh, which we get from local tree surgeons. And, and that's that's made such a difference. They look fantastic this year. Uh, we're creating, we, we use uh, all of the weeds and so on, go back into, into compost. And the staff bring in all of their kind of vegetable peelings and bits and pieces. And, and we've got some really lovely big compost bays. Uh, we're, we've got some boggy areas, which we're, we're sort of cultivating other than the willow car area. And, you know, brash grass piles and then this fantastic water collection there's no water on the site which is ironic seeing as it houses London's deepest borehole so uh, we really struggle for watering stuff in the summer so we've got this great system a couple of which I found in a skip which was rather good so other bits and pieces that we've done um, Insect hotels seem to have figured in these talks, don't they? Um, and I thought ours was rather good, but actually having looked at some of the other people's, they're rather good as well. But again, it was just made out of um, pallets, old roof tiles, just stuff that happened to be around, basically. And then we use things like the old, you know, containers with holes in it to plant bulbs in. We've got a foxglove patch here. Um, sort of along the front of the site here so you can see there's a there's a busy footpath that goes along here and then along this section we've created wildflower and pollinator patches and you can just see the tops of the the crab apple trees uh, which are as i say much much happier than they used to be um oops sorry i've gone so i thought it might be interesting to just um give you a sort of a, a brief case study based on one of our young people um, so we have young people access the site two or three times a week, a, a week during sort of the school day, and we work with classes and we also work with individual kids. Um, one of our young people, who's who's not who's probably 
not atypical of, of our, our young people. He's Joe, he's 15, and he, he does have quite severe and complex autism. But he, interestingly, he's got speech. He, he, his speech is easy to understand, and he's, he's quite a smart young man. But he has such, such high anxiety levels that it really prevents him from participating most uh, much in, in sort of anything, really. Uh, he can't be in the classroom a lot of the time. He finds it too stressful being around his peer group. And then that can manifest in, in, in violence. But his, his um, teachers noticed that he did like spending time outside. So we thought that he would be a real kind of, you know, a young person who would benefit a lot from coming over to Saplings. So over he came. Um, but for the first six weeks, I've got a storage bench that we keep our um, tools in. They got chucked out and he stayed in there for the sessions, first two or three sessions, actually. Um, but we sort of left him to it a little bit, just let him try and get used to things in his own time. And then one of the sessions when I'd been working with some of the other pupils on the Willow car, Joe emerged and um, he noticed that there were some newts there. And it was incredible. He he. Um, he just started talking about them. He, he knew an awful lot about them and the teaching staff hadn't really realised that he had that sort of knowledge. Um, and so now over time, he, he comes over, he used to come over on his own, but now he has started to be able to take part in group sessions, which is amazing. And we've designated him as our chief biodiversity consultant amongst the pupils. And he, he, he really genuinely sort of comes in and he looks at the wildlife and then he's, he's been working on um, taking pictures of them and photocopying those and laminating them. And we've now got a display at the front of the site, uh, courtesy of him, which has got sort of various um, things that we've, we've seen. And these are just a few of them here. So that's, uh, that's been great. Um, I've just got to show you this actually, because this this gives you a little bit of a feel for the for the woodland section of the site. It's really beautiful. Um, Joe particularly likes that space, so if he's feeling stressed, he just goes and he spends a little bit of time in there on his own. Um, what we've tried to do with that is to follow. We followed the natural pathways that the animals, so the foxes in particular, have created, and then we've just put bark chippings on those. The reason for that was to try and prevent our pupils um, can sort of run around all over the place a bit. And what we were trying to do was to not have them just trampling over everything, but to actually try and follow a natural pathway, which and that seems to have worked really, really well. So, yeah, 2020, it's been a bit of a strange year for, for everybody. Um, sadly, it prevented our corporate volunteer groups coming, which caused me to panic a bit because we really rely on them to help us maintain the space. Um, so no corporate groups this year, but actually we have latterly been able to have some of our local people. So we're, 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 we're sort of managing it, but it's been challenging. Um, interestingly, when schools closed down, our pupils continued to become to come because they're a, we're a special school. But actually, I was in we were having this sort of really really complex kids, so they were a slightly different group to be working with. But that's that's been fine. Uh, but there have been positives, as you saw in one of the pictures. Um, we've got a very busy kind of. Well, it didn't used to be that busy, but during lockdown, when people could only really walk from A to B, there was just a huge amount of foot traffic and lots and lots of families. And that has been brilliant. Um, we've got a few scarecrows on the site and uh, you know, kids would stop and see those. We rather randomly got a dolphin that was given to us, which was a shop fitting in Oxford Street somewhere. Kids like that. So it's become a real talking point. And what's happened is we're now having we don't get many negative comments anymore where we used to have a lot initially we get lots and lots of positive feedback and we actually had quite a few people now wanting to get involved offering to help which is which has been brilliant um we've continued following our environmental management plan so all of our biodiversity work, work has just about remained on track and we're actually sort of increasing it and we're, we're we've got other things planned for next year and just started making a pond um, and one really major um, breakthrough has been the allotments next door to us were, were some of the main groups vocal against us taking on the land in the first place. But they have now approached us, said they like what we're doing. 
they've um, asked for their biodiversity person to come and have a look and to talk to us and they're now sort of really very supportive which is something I never thought would happen so that's that's really good news so that's it I mean basically absolutely everything we've done can be easily very easily replicated we haven't got any money so you can do most of it pretty much for free in my experience people are very willing to give you sort of seeds and, and materials and so on if they know what it's for we're always very very happy to answer any questions anybody has about the project and uh, and thank you very much for listening back to joe Thank you very much, Julia. That was um, that was absolutely fascinating, and uh, you know what a remarkable story about Joe. Thank you for sharing that. Right, I'm going to uh, turn over now to um, ask our panelists some questions. Thank you for those who have posted. If anybody would like to post additional questions, please. It is not too late. Um, you're more than welcome. I also have a few of my own. So I'm actually going to um, hog the microphone just for a moment longer and uh, ask a couple of questions whilst you all um, think about your own and post them for me. Um, I'm going to start with Martina. I mean, you know, Martina, absolutely, um, you know, incredible to listen to the, the case studies that our panellists have shared, you know, very much in, you know, part of the legacy that you've created by developing, uh, you know, supporting the team and developing the, the big awards. Um, you know, how... The, the cynics out there, if you like, you know, would, would say, oh, you know, awards are just nice to have. They're not necessarily critical or, or they don't drive long lasting change. You know, I, I personally disagree with that. And how influential and impactful do you do you think, uh, you know, awards like this are in, in driving change and in, and in particular driving, uh, you know, altering the way developers operate? Thanks, Joe, for that question. I think it has been um, incredibly influential. Um, we see that um, if someone has a great success, obviously, um, we've noticed that they're more able to get funding for other biodiversity initiatives. And you can see that actually in our sponsors as well. And there definitely is some really healthy competition out there. So when somebody uh, has won and, and then they're justifiably marketing, um, we can see that other groups really step up their efforts. So I would say it, it's amazingly um, influential. And what we also see is that people um, that really have a passion for it, and you're hearing um, Julia's um, talk talk there, we're also working with a, um, a, a group called Grow to Know, and they are um, a group that are um, trying to inspire young people in the Grand Grand Hotel. To, to be able to take part in gardening and ecotherapy. Now, um, the person who, who's the director of that group has already come and spoken to Julia to get uh, her knowledge and her experience of how she, she's done this. So you can see how this can really spread. So I think the potential for legacy in all of this and sharing this best practice is brilliant. And, and it's wonderful also that people have been sharing so freely, so willingly giving their time and really encouraging other people to have the same success that they have. So that's wonderful to see. Well said, Martina. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of uh, quite practical questions come in. Obviously, um, got some listeners that are hoping to replicate the efforts of our panellists. Um, got a very practical question for you, Zoe. Uh, an individual um, uh, Marion Markham would like to know whether uh, there was a native meadow mix that you used um, uh, for Cornwall to encourage local species to grow? Yeah, so quite a lot of work was done um, contacting a variety of suppliers um, in Cornwall and around the UK um, to basically put a variety of um, mixes together. One of those was a native mix. Um, so yeah, we've been very conscious um, from the beginning about what seed mixes and in general what plant species have gone in. Um, and we've had consultation with um, uh, local ecologists um, and with Cornwall Council's ecologists as well. So we've had a lot of feed into that and made sure that we're consistent across all of our sites in Cornwall. Super. And, you know, Julia gave a good example of um, of how you, know, you don't need to have banks of cash in order to improve biodiversity. Um, you know, I, I understand that, um, you know, in Cornwall, we've lost the ERDF funding. So do you, have you got visibility over how investment into biodiversity works are going to continue? So uh, it's an interesting one because it's definitely a, a conversation that's happening a lot in the office at the moment um, with our last ERDF sort of funded projects sort of 
wrapping up in the next couple of years. I think the biggest thing is attitude change. Um, it was definitely flagged up a couple of years ago. Elected councillors within Cornwall um, would never have supported um, change from the old ways of grass cutting um, of open spaces and on the ro uh, road verges. However, because of the work that has been done, that attitude has changed. So we obviously are looking to see what comes out from the UK government with regards to funding in Cornwall. But we are noticing that without having to put money in, we can make um, biodiversity improvements without investing money, just changing management practices and the way we approach maintenance. Um, so we would look at that softer, more cost effective approach, I think, in the short term. And obviously, we'll just see what happens in the future with regards to funding before we can know the full long term impact on how that's going to affect us and our improvements. Right. And yeah, I think that is a misconception, isn't it? That people think that you do need to, to significantly invest to make a change. But actually, as you've highlighted, it's just a process, altering the process, the way we do things um, can, can have significant impact on biodiversity improvement. Um, Leonardo, we've got a practical question for you that was actually posted by one of our panellists, but I think our attendees can probably get some benefit from it. Again, it's a very practical question asking you um you know when you guys were restoring the road verges what did you do with the collected grass waste um given that it was most likely heavily, heavily polluted with litter and detritus well i think we uh, we always try to combine litter picking with the grass cutting um, it, it's um, it's incredible the amount of litter you do find on road verges um, especially when you come in and doing um, maintenance uh, once a year you won't cover a lot of um, crisp packs and chocolate wrappers and that sort of stuff. So we try to combine both, um, do the litter picking beforehand um, and then collecting all the risings. Um, and what we do with the risings, we normally try to keep it on site as much as we can uh, in designated areas or within woodland plots so that to, to minimize, to speed up the process and minimize the costs and uh, uh, keeping the uh, carbon footprint of the operations down as well. Super, thank you. And and yes, it is. Um, I think that is one of the uh, crying shames in the UK, isn't it? That we, you know, you've only got to drive down some of our main roads and, you know, people pull over or they, uh, you know, they, they get to um, a slipway and they just, you know, throw their, throw their, um, you know, rubbish in their cabin out onto the road verge. It's such a shame. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Seems to be an ongoing battle. Um, Martin, I've got a question uh, for you. Um, you know, really interesting to hear about the commercial benefits of, of your scheme. You know, saving £70,000 is certainly nothing to be. But was it, um, how difficult was it, you know, at the beginning to get the project on board and engaged with, you know, sustainable objectives? Because it, it seems to me like there, were, there was a couple of clear options there. You, 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 could, you could do the upgrade the right way. Or you could do it the easiest way um, you know and sometimes we are guilty of, of taking the path of least resistance which isn't necessarily the, the sustainable route so um, you know did you find your business leaders were willing to have that discussion around taking the right way yes I think I think I think going back to what was mentioned earlier about um, putting in for the exam rewards and things the side effect of that is that uh, we've been working with our business for a couple of years now, building up that sort of approach that these kind of things matter. And um, when you have uh, put in for these awards and you see what other people are doing and you see that we are winning awards for these kind of things, it actually helps internally people to understand that actually it does matter to us, that it is important, it is part and parcel of the life cycle of what we, we want to deliver. So we've kind of got that behind the scenes in terms of what people are expecting. The other side of it, of course, is that ability to push back at the client. Um, quite often the client comes in expecting things to be done in a certain way. Um, and one of the things we always impart in our projects is that, 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 that ownership where and we've demonstrated this in the past where we are more than happy to push back at clients and say, actually, that's not how we would want to deliver this. There are other options and start going through those. And it's not always a case of, oh, OK, that, that's what they want to deliver. That's what we're going to deliver. It's a case of showing that leadership and saying, actually, we can do it better. Uh, and the project teams themselves understand that. And from the very start, especially on this project, um, 
from the very first walkthroughs and having those discussions beyond just the technical so it's just beyond the yes okay we've got to build this we've got to put the cabling there we've got to connect all this together we've got to bring materials in it's those sustainability questions of okay so how are you going to achieve that and just the walking through the woodland and saying okay don't forget you've got uh, root protection zones to to manage here now the potential is to bring the materials through the amount of material you are going to have to bring in to build this whole road from those very first conversations you can see the cogs whirring and people are thinking actually no no this isn't going to be the solution for us we've got to find something different um so yeah actually uh, and to be honest with you we couldn't have achieved this if the projects hadn't been on board from the start you know people like myself and others as we know we can get on a soapbox and we complete on as much as we want to people going what the right thing is it's about ownership and it's about that culture of going actually i want to do this because i can see the benefits from it and this was why this project was so successful because the project team owned it and they owned it from the start because they could tell the alternative you know it wasn't worth uh, considering super yeah that ownership piece is so important um and we're nearly at time but i would just like to you know i'm, I'm very much intrigued julia i'd like to just uh, ask my last question to you because I'd, I'd like to know what other plans you've got for your your fantastic site <laughs> um well we're going to carry on following the the environmental management plan and, and, and maintaining it we hope that uh, we've actually just won um uh, charity of the of the next five years from a massive insurance company so we're going to have lots of corporate volunteer groups to to manage for that so so that's uh, I, it's exciting but it's also a bit daunting actually um, we're going to create a pond which is long overdue so I'm quite looking forward to doing that um, might need to uh, ask Martina for some help with that we're going to one of the things we've, I've got some guys who are fantastic at uh, woodworking and so on now. So we're going to create a sort of sensory trail through the woods with um, boxes that the kids can lift up and put things in, and uh, even just things like for some of them touching mud. They they don't want to be anywhere near mud, so we'll fill a box with mud, or they can fill some of the boxes. So so a sensory trail of some sort. We're going to put some hammocks between the trees so they can go and chill out there and just kind of look up at the sky and so on. Um, and we're, as soon as we can, we're probably probably going to start trying to have some of the local schools as well, particularly primary schools, come and access the space. And to sort of, again, what we see as a sort of reverse inclusion so that, so that uh, children from mainstream schools can come and join us rather than our kids being the sort of token autistic kid at their school. So, so we've got, uh, got a few things planned. Super. Well, it all sounds extremely inspiring. And I, I know I've got a number of executives that don't like mud either. So I'm going to send them your way. Get them Excellent. I'm good at, I'm good at teaching people how to play with mud. <laughs> Brilliant. I shall send them your way. I need to reconnect with the natural world. Well, you know, I'd like to just, I'm going to hand over to, to Dirk again, just in a few moments, but um, just a, a few final thoughts from myself. Firstly, to say thank you very much to all of our panelists, um, a couple of things that stood out for me. I mean, you know, firstly, Martina, you know, thank you so much for being part of the team that has created the platform to really, you know, showcase what can be done through these fantastic case studies. Um, you know, 2020 has been the year that has highlighted to everybody that the protection of wild spaces has a direct impact on our own health and well-being and uh, longevity um you know Zoe, from learning about um your project you know how you how you have so effectively engaged the public with those those green spaces you know we've we've progressively become more and more disconnected from the natural world as, as we've moved through the years and you know if we are going to win this battle for sustainability it really comes down to those uh, those individual decisions and getting people to care um, you know I, I firmly believe that it's the individual that will that will win or lose this battle for us so fantastic project there um, you know Leonardo effectively demonstrating how businesses can can you know effectively cultivate biodiversity within the the estate parameters within their control and not necessarily in areas that are the most obvious um you know the the verge spaces on on our main roads absolutely fantastic and i was 
um, reading a statistic in the newspaper just the other day about the the rich wildlife that is present on our on our um, green verges. So you know, a fantastic initiative there, and you know, good luck in tackling the litter as well, because I feel that is that that is the next um, pain point that we need to get to grips with. You know, Martin, you clearly demonstrated how you know essential upgrade uh, works and improvement works can be achieved in an environmentally mindful way, but with a commercial gain. You know, too often I think we still have business leaders who don't understand that actually doing things the right way um, can have a, a really positive impact on their bottom line and the, um, the sheer amount of waste you know that you that you prevented from being generated absolutely fantastic um and julia you know really really great to see how um you know the the power of green spaces on on an individual's well-being and you know the case study of joe really stands out to me and and also how you know you don't need to be a, 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 an expert you don't necessarily need to have a degree in ecology to be able to have a significant impact on uh, the biodiversity in your area, but also the way you engage your community and crucially dispel those misconceptions that can so clearly divide us at a time when we need to be united behind a common goal. So thank you all very much to our panellists. Um, absolutely delightful to hear from you all and I shall now hand back to Dirk. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you for summing it up really well, I think, uh, what we've heard today. Thank you to all the panelists for your moving and inspirational stories, and I hope it will inspire um, the next generation of uh, award uh, applications to, to come in uh, next year, and, and that you will take that as food for thought and inspiration uh, to take forward. Um, if you have any further questions um, for the panelists or for Syria, just drop us a line. Um, I, I really. I uh, do appreciate the, um, the good turnout we've had and the interest, and we hope to see your applications flooding in over the next few months. And um, last but not least, thank you again to Kia and Joe in particular for um, supporting uh, the big awards again this year, and we will see you again next year. Thanks again for attending. Goodbye. <laughs>